Welcome back for another video on stockholder rights, and today we're going to talk about the duty of loyalty. That's the loyalty that directors owe to stockholders and stockholders' rights to sue if those rights are impinged upon. So we are in the second of three major stockholder rights. As a reminder, stockholders have the right to vote and vote and change directors and management to, in some cases, modify bylaws, vote for precatory proposals. Now we're in the main heart of stockholder litigation, the right to sue for breach of the duty of care, the duty of loyalty breaches, and maybe breaches of the duty of oversight. And up next, we'll talk about stockholder rights to sell their shares and to remedy their own situation by ditching stock that they don't want to hold anymore. So let's talk about director conflicts, and we have a couple of different components to cover today. We're going to start by identifying director conflict of interest transactions. We're going to call them DCITs for short, and a director conflict of interest transaction is simply where a director is on both sides of a transaction. They're not necessarily bad. In fact, sometimes they're good. So we're going to talk about how they can be cleansed, how they can be permitted. There are a couple different procedural mechanisms we need to know about for that. We're going to look at a traditional approach to cleansing DCITs in the case of Milliard Brick. Milliard Brick being a California case, uh, California Section 820 pertained to that one, but we're actually going to focus, as we get into the modern law, on Delaware General Corporation Law Section 144, a much more modern interpretation of DCIT cleansing statutes. Major case under that one is Benihana of Tokyo versus Benihana Inc., a pretty fun case, if I may say so myself, some colorful characters. You'll get to meet Rocky Aoki and uh, he's an interesting guy, for sure. Speaking of modern, we're going to look at the Model Business Corporations Act, subchapter F, which is in some ways even more modern than the Delaware law. Of course, uh, many of our publicly traded companies are in Delaware, and so Delaware is a really important venue, but many states have adopted the MBCA, and so MBCA subchapter F uh, and how it approaches DCITs will be relevant as well. So that's our subjects for today, and let's go ahead and get started. To introduce the topic, I just want to briefly set a few themes up. You know, just like our, our, our horse here in the picture who has uh, a couple different incentives, has a conflict of interest, he's attracted to a lady horse across the fence, and he's also uh, attracted to that carrot dangling in front of him, and he's spurred on by his uh, owner there. Horses being an example of an agent, you know, the owner being the principal, who uh, is asking the horse to do his work for him, to pull the cart, and uh, the horse is tasked with doing that in the owner's best interest. But he's got some competing interests here, and that's not uncommon. Uh, many times in life, a person can have competing interests. They may be the director of a corporation and also looking to increase their executive compensation. So anytime a director is setting their own compensation, that creates a conflict of interest. Or some people are directors of multiple corporations, maybe two corporations that share a common director want to have a transaction. It's not necessarily bad, but it raises some questions about who does that director really work for. In venture capital, the venture capital investors have a conflict of interest because they sit on the boards of corporations, but they also invest in the corporations. So when it comes time for another round of financing, the venture capital investors want the best deal for their investment funds, and the company wants the best deal for itself. So there are lots of instances where conflicts of interest come up. And just because there is a conflict doesn't mean a transaction is unfair, but it does raise some questions that we will need to address. And that's why we have a process to cure these transactions in a way that makes them not voidable. And in that way, we can have certainty that these transactions will be upheld by courts. A director conflict of interest transaction, again, is just when a director is on both sides of a deal. It's not necessarily prohibited. It's not necessarily unfair. And, you know, in the example of the venture capital, for instance, having a venture capitalist on your board is great because you're probably going to have an audience with them when you need some more money for your company. And so it's not necessarily bad to have a director on both sides, but it does call into question the conflicts that arise in a person's mind. And so we're going to label those as director conflict of interest transactions. As I mentioned, just because a transaction has a conflicted director, a director on both sides, doesn't inherently mean 
it's not fair, but how do we know if it's fair or not? Well, we could look at procedure or we could look at substance. So what does that mean? Looking at procedure means how was the deal approved? Was it approved with paper and process? Were there disinterested people involved in that process? Substantively fair means looking at whether the deal was valuable to shareholders. And it turns out that's a bit harder, especially for courts to do. So not to give away the punchline, but uh, we'll see that courts have resolved on mostly a procedural fairness standard. That said, there are a couple different ways courts could have gone about this. Uh, we could think about a flat prohibition, meaning the corporation cannot enter into any transaction with any person or entity in which the director has a conflicting interest. So just no DCITs. If it's a DCIT, it's prohibited. As I mentioned uh, with the venture capital example and many other examples, that may be very short-sighted. It could prohibit a great many transactions simply because a director sits on more than one board or has relationships in multiple organizations. Quite frankly, having a director who sits on more than one board might be advantageous to the company. It might give you access, uh, and that might just be how business gets done. We could have the shareholders ratify, uh, shareholder validation process, stockholder validation, shareholder validation. The corporation could uh, require the stockholders or shareholders to ratify or approve the trans transaction and only enter into DCITs if the shareholders validate it. Uh, that would avoid the flat prohibition problems, but a um, couple issues. As we'll see in Remilliard Brick, what if the directors are also the shareholders or comprise some large shareholders? It's very common in private companies that uh, directors would also be Shareholders, because uh, the shareholders, as you know, appoint the directors and the shareholders of a small company might appoint themselves. Or for that matter, what if there's a majority or a very large minority of shareholders that are able to some exercise some kind of veto? And uh, as a result, block transactions, which are good for the company in general. So shareholder ratification doesn't solve all of our problems, and it goes against one of our fundamental axioms of corporate law, which is that the directors not the shareholders, or on the corporation. So there are some challenges with a shareholder-stockholder uh, ratification approval regime. Next up, what about director ratification? There are disinterested directors maybe on the board. Not everyone has a conflict of interest in that particular transaction. The DCIT pertains only to some directors. How about if the rest of the directors enter into a ratification of that transaction if they say the transaction's fair. Well, that's based on some logic. Uh, in fact, that is a kind of a prevailing view. Directors have been hired to do what's best for the company. They run the company, and the business judgment rule protects informed, non-conflicted decisions. And so that is a leading choice right now. But it does have a problem, which uh, is a structural bias argument. By structural bias, I mean that you know, you might be friends with the other directors. You might go to the same country club. You might go to the same birthday parties, and you might want to help each other out. Maybe a I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of relationship among directors. And if that's the case, then we can't really count on the disinterested directors to watch out for the best interests of the corporation when their buddy, the conflicted director, has an interest in the transaction. Well, so how will we leave it for a judge to decide? I mean, judges are smart. Why don't we let them Make a fairness review. If a conflict of interest transaction proceeds and a shareholder wants to sue, let them take it to court and the court can determine what is fair. Uh, substantively, was this transaction fair to shareholders? Well, you know, while that might sound like a good idea, uh, I'm not so sure that judicial fairness is entirely fair. It's extremely difficult for a judge to examine a challenge transaction years after it occurred. And the judge will determine what the judge thinks is fair. This takes all of the corporate decision makers out of the process, the shareholders, the directors. And, and as a result, uh, it creates a lot of confusion and uncertainty as to whether these transactions will go forward. So you might chill transactions you want to have. You might create incentives for litigation. And so the entire fairness review uh, may not be entirely fair either. Before we get into the traditional approach of how courts deal with DCITs, let's just make sure we all are crystal clear on what a DCIT, a director conflict of interest transaction, is. Let me give you an example that I totally made up. 
these are not real facts, although uh, this is a real guy on a real board. Uh, I made up United Logistics. All right, so here's the hypo. United Logistics provides commercial shipping and trucking services to retailers, including Target stores, with whom United has a long-term fixed price per mile contract. They pay 10 bucks a mile. And an oil embargo drives diesel prices up 50%, such that United is not even breaking even on its shipping services at this agreed-upon rate of 10 bucks a mile. United asked Target to modify the agreement in light of the changed circumstances. Otherwise, United says it will go out of business. And moreover, you know, there aren't a lot of options in the marketplace because a lot of trucking companies are under duress at this point. All right. Well, is Target allowed to modify this agreement? It would be, except that George Barrett is a owner of United and Barrett is a significant stockholder and member of the board of directors of Target. Mr. Barrett is on both sides of this transaction, and that creates some question marks. I mean, is George Barrett going to be looking out for United's best interests or in Target's best interests? Is this deal fair to Target, or is Barrett, who owns United, looking to preserve his company at the expense of his shareholders at Target? This is a DCIT, a Director Conflict of Interest transaction, because Barrett stands on both sides. How are courts going to decide whether to allow Target to modify its agreement? Let's talk about the traditional approach to this problem. Under the traditional approach, three things, each of which independently would cleanse this DCIT and make it permissible. Either director or shareholder approval, and whether or not that means disinterested director approval, well, it does today, but as we'll see in Remilliard Brick, the courts, at least in California, uh, had to sort that one out, uh, but uh, disinterested director approval will cleanse the transaction. Uh, disinterested shareholder approval will cleanse that transaction, or a showing in court that the transaction was approved by a fair process, uh, appropriate paper and process that they considered it, or uh, in addition, you could say that the the process was substantively fair, that it worked out well for Target, and so Target shareholders uh, don't get to sue because they were better off for it. And so these are the traditional approaches, and we're going to see in Rumiliard Brick how they played out. But again, we've got disinterested director approval, disinterested shareholder approval, procedural fairness, and substantive fairness, all of which will independently, each of them, will cleanse a DCIT. Rumiliard Brick versus Rumiliard Dandini Co. was a classic DCIT. In this case, the directors, Stanley and Sturgis, owned a majority of the shares in Remilliard Dandini Company. And they controlled the board of directors of Remilliard Dandini Company and its wholly owned subsidiary, San Jose Brick and Tile Limited. And they were also executive officers of both corporations. And they caused Remilliard Dandini and its subsidiary, San Jose Brick and Tile, which were both manufacturing companies, to sell their bricks to Remilliard Dandini Sales Corporation, which Stanley and Sergis totally owned, controlled, and operated. Again, we have a manufacturing company, or a pair of manufacturing companies, one in its subsidiary, which is partially owned by Stanley and Sergis, and also owned by a number of other shareholders. And they're going to sell their bricks to Remilliard Dandini Sales Corporation. We can call it the sales company, which is entirely owned by Stanley and Sturgis. This is a director conflict of interest transaction because, as I mentioned, Stanley and Sturgis were the executive officers, the directors, uh, majority shareholders of the manufacturing companies, and also owned and operated the sales company. So definitely on both sides of that transaction. Now, Stanley and Sturgis were certainly exercising their power, but they weren't necessarily the bad guy here. It turns out that another guy, A.O. Dandini, the former husband of Lillian Dandini, uh, as you can tell, this was uh, Remilliard Brick Covers, Remilliard Dandini Company, so the Dandinis had mismanaged and misappropriated funds. Stanley and Sturgis were concerned about this misappropriation and were trying to buy out that minority interest and take control of the company away from Lillian Dandini. So Lillian said, no, she's not interested in selling, and she's going to uh, try to maintain her control of the company, maintain her power uh, here. Stanley and Sturgis don't like 
Lillian, and so they conceive of the idea of splitting the sales function from the manufacturing function of the company. And, and it seemed like they were doing this to grab power. They were doing this because they were not able to buy the shares from Lillian Dandini. They wanted total control. They wanted unlimited power. But Lillian said no, and they came up with this uh, too clever by half scheme, perhaps, in order to, to uh, uh, control the company by splitting the sales and manufacturing function, owning the sales company, and causing the company to sell its bricks to the sales company, giving them total control over the operations. So this scheme, such as it were, was disclosed, as I mentioned, to the minority shareholder. That was Lillian, who did not want to sell her shares. Uh, they told her they wanted to do this, and then they went ahead and approved it over her objections. Uh, this was a scheme, it turns out, for uh, Stanley and Sturgis to effectively push Lillian out by taking the profits. Uh, Stanley and Sturgis would, by this scheme, obtain profits from the sale of bricks that would uh, ordinarily go to the manufacturing company. Now that's going to go to the sales company that they wholly own instead of the company that they partially owned, cutting Lillian out of the profit loop. And the sales company was a shell, basically. It, it was, again, cooked up as part of this scheme. Uh, they created the sales company, but they didn't actually invest anything in it. They had put about uh, a little over a 1000 bucks in it, didn't have any equipment, had a truck and a trailer, and uh, apparently the trailer had some used office furniture in it, but uh, not exactly a uh, kosher deal, you might say. But hey, they claim, you know what? We told Lillian about this. Uh, she said she didn't like it, but uh, the majority of the directors approved it. The majority of the shareholders approved it, and um, you know that, that cleanses the DCIT. It must be fair and, and equitable to the corporation, uh, uh, to the manufacturing corporation, because it was approved by the shareholders. You know, oddly enough, they had a basis in law for this. Uh, they had a basis in law that by approving their own scheme uh, against, the, against the arguments of the minority shareholders that they were stealing, uh, that this was uh, going to approve the transaction. California Corporations Code Section 820 at the time said, a DCIT is not void or voidable where the fact of the common directorship or financial interest is disclosed or known to the board of directors or committee and noted in the minutes and the board or committee authorizes, approves, or ratifies the contract or transaction in good faith by a vote sufficient for the purpose without counting the vote or votes of such director or directors. In other words, they're not taking into account the fact that some of the directors are interested. The fact that it was disclosed to all the directors and that the directors as a whole approved the transaction, even though some of them were uh, quite interested in it, uh, according to California law, at least they claimed, this was going to be an approved transaction, right? And again, to, to put a finer point on it, Stanley and Sturgis disclosed their conflict to the board, which they controlled, and they voted to approve the conflict. Can the directors cleanse their own conflict? Sounds like they can under Section 820. What does the court say? No, that can't be right. Any doesn't mean any. Well, that's weird. I mean, something sounds fishy here. Uh, well, we read the statute. It did say any, but the court says, nope, that's not what California meant. That's just, that can't be right. Uh, transactions unfair and unreasonable to the corporation are voidable. And the court says uh, corporate law does not permit an officer or director by abuse of his power to obtain an unfair advantage or profit for himself at the expense of the corporation. It would be a shocking concept of corporate morality to hold that because the majority directors or stockholders disclose their purpose and interest, they may strip a corporation of its assets to their own financial advantage, and the minority is without legal redress. Well, this is Judge Raymond E. Peters who wrote that opinion, and let's hear a little more we had to say because I'm pretty sure California Corporations Code Section 820 didn't say that. I'm just going to go ahead and read Section 820 again here. And, uh, uh, okay, it says uh, a DCIT will not be void or voidable uh, if the circumstances specified in any, in any of the following subdivisions exist. A, the fact of common directorship or financial interest is disclosed or known to the board. 
of directors or committee and noted in the minutes, and the board or committee authorizes, approves, or ratifies the contract or transaction in good faith by a vote sufficient for the purpose. Okay, it says any, and it says the board can authorize, and uh, that's what it did. So, all right, your turn, Judge Peters. Uh, what is the uh, right way to interpret this statute? Uh, while the transaction is not voidable simply because an interested director participated, it will not be upheld if it is unfair to the minority stockholders. In the instant case, there is uncontroverted evidence that the directors used their majority power for their own personal advantage and to the detriment of the minority stockholder. It is the law in every state that directors have fiduciary duties to all stockholders, which clearly includes even the minority. It is a cardinal, cardinal principle of corporate law that a director cannot, at the expense of the corporation, make an unfair profit from his position. All right, I can't disagree with you there, but how are we going to deal with this, uh, this law? Well, let's pull out the hornbook. Uh, it is hornbook law, says the judge, that while directors are not strictly trustees, uh, they are fiduciaries and bear a fiduciary relationship to the corporation and all stockholders. They owe a duty to all stockholders, including the minority stockholders, and must administer their duties for the common benefit. The concept that a corporation is an entity cannot operate so as to lessen the duties owed to all of the stockholders. Directors owe a duty of the highest good faith to the corporation and its stockholders. It is a cardinal principle of corporate law that a director cannot, at the expense of his corporation, make an unfair profit from his position. He is precluded from receiving any personal advantage without fullest disclosure to and consent of all those affected. Hey, I, I don't disagree with you, Judge. I just don't think that's what the law said. Anyway, Fletcher on corporate law goes on and makes similar points. And I'll tell you how this all worked out. California legislature changed section 820. I don't think the judge read the law correctly, but I think he understood corporate law better than the legislature did, at least in California. After the Remiliard decision, the California legislature amended its statutory code, section 820, to disqualify shares voted by interested directors in a stockholder vote. This would have changed the outcome of the case without the court having to pretend the statute did not mean what it said. However, I think the court did get it right from a higher principles, and sometimes courts don't follow a bad law. Maybe Delaware has better laws. Delaware General Corporation Law Section 144 says an interested transaction will not automatically be void or avoidable solely because of the director's interest if there has been informed disinterested board approval or informed stockholder approval or the transaction is fair to the corporation. Now here we have the concept of disinterested board approval. We do not have the concept of disinterested stockholder approval. Maybe judges will write that into the law as a matter of common law. And then we have the entire fairness standard. But note, Delaware General Corporation Law Section 144 does move past Section 820 in requiring disinterested director approval but it doesn't seem to require informed shareholder approval. It also says will not automatically be void or voidable, but it seems to open the door to the possibility it still would be void or voidable somehow. As I mentioned, sometimes courts evolve the statute in particular directions, and Delaware has evolved this statute, the statutory provision 144, to be more than just not automatically void or voidable, but to actually create a safe harbor. Delaware courts today treat DGCL section 144 as a safe harbor, and so if disinterested directors approve the transaction, it will not be voided by courts. But what if the interested directors are also a majority of the shareholders or a large minority of the shareholders? Will you still get in the safe harbor by having interested shareholders approve the transaction? No. You don't get the safe harbor by having interested shareholders approve. It does help. It gets you, it qualifies you under Section 144 as not automatically void or voidable, but it is now common to obtain a majority of the minority, meaning the disinterested shareholders. If the disinterested shareholders approve the transaction, or at least a majority of disinterested shareholders approve the transaction, that is generally felt to be a safe harbor. So we see the common law in Delaware has evolved a little bit from the statutory law, and the way you can understand Section 144 is if a majority of disinterested directors who are informed approve the transaction, looks like a safe harbor. 
if a majority of disinterested stockholders approve the transaction. That also probably creates a safe harbor. And that's where you want to be if you're advising corporations. You don't want to be risking the entire fairness review. Let's look at a modern Delaware corporation under the modern, uh, fairly modern, uh, not quite as modern as the Model Business Corporations Act, but the current Delaware 144 standard with the case of Benihana of Tokyo versus Benihana Inc. In this case, we're dealing with a gentleman named Rocky Aoki, who founded Benihana of Tokyo and its subsidiary, Benihana Inc., which operates restaurants worldwide. Benihana Inc. needed to raise funds to renovate its restaurants. It was trying to update them, and it was having a little trouble getting the money to do it. In addition to securing a line of credit, the corporation needed additional funding. So the BHI board, Benihana Inc., approved the issuance of a $20 million convertible preferred stock financing. It considered numerous other alternatives. It obtained a fairness opinion. And where is it going to get this equity investment from? From BFC Financial. And the issue here is, guess what? There's a director on both sides. So John Abdo was a director and vice chairman of BFC Financial, and he was also this is John Abdo, a director of Bini Hana Inc., BHI. John Abdo owned 30% of BFC Financial and was a director of Bini Hana Inc. John Abdo stands on both sides of this transaction, and he negotiated the transaction on behalf of BFC, not on the half, behalf of Bini Hana. The Bini Hana Inc. board knew about Abdo's stake in BFC and approved the sale anyway. They didn't have a lot of options, it turned out. But somebody wasn't so happy about this. The issuance of the preferred stock diluted Rocky Aoki's share of Benihana Inc. Aoki, through Benihana of Tokyo, filed suit against all of the BHI directors except for himself for a breach of the duty of loyalty and against BFC for aiding and abetting the fiduciary violations. The Delaware Supreme Court discussed the applications of the safe harbor provision in DGCL section 144A1 in reference to these allegations that a director used confidential information against BHI. So was BHI, was Benihana Inc. authorized to issue the $20 million in stock to BFC? And did the BHI board act improperly, breaching their duty of loyalty in approving the transaction? Did the directors, including John Abdo, engage in prohibited self-dealing? Let's talk about Rocky Aoki for a second while we think about that. Rocky Aoki was really a character. Now, this is who is suing through Benihana of Tokyo, Benihana Inc. He was born Hiroki Aoki in Japan. He's known as Rocky Aoki, and interestingly, he was a wrestler before he founded the popular Japanese restaurant. He was, in fact, induced into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in 1995. He was also married three times, and he is the father of relatively famous DJ Steve Aoki, famous in part for throwing cake in the face of his fans at his concerts. And Aoki got himself into a couple scrapes, literally and figuratively. On June 9, 1998, Aoki was charged with insider trading. He pled guilty in 1999, and he died of complications from hepatitis C. The disease was reportedly the result of a blood transfusion after a 1979 speedboat crash into the Golden Gate Bridge. Today, his grave is found at the Josinji Buddhist Temple in Ukasawa, Setagaya Ward, Tokyo, Japan. So is our restauranteur wrestler going to prevail in this case? Or was the DCIT properly cleansed by the board vote? Was BHI authorized to issue the $20 million in stock? Did the BHI board act improperly in approving the transaction? Yes, Benihana Inc. was authorized. And no, the BHI board did not act improperly. Here, the disinterested directors had all the material information they needed about Abdo's interest in the transaction. The disinterested directors approved, and 
disinterested shareholders approved, resulting in an effective approval and ratification of this transaction. Sorry, Rocky, you lost this round. This is a story about process. This is a story about the board going through a appropriate process and as a result enjoying the safe harbor of DGCL section 144. Process, it would seem, is the gold standard. And the 144 safe harbor for an interested transaction will exist if material facts are known to the board and the board in good faith authorize the transaction by a majority of disinterested and independent directors. The judicial review then is just a review of the process. Did the board have the information? Did the board approve the transaction? Was the approval by a majority of disinterested and independent directors? The only examination the court will take is whether the process was sufficient to protect the disinterested shareholders. Most recently amended in 2005 are even more modern statute, the Modern Business Corporations Act, which has been adopted in many states, subchapter F has its own test for a director conflicting interest transaction. It defines a DCIT as a transaction by the corporation where the director is a party or has knowledge and material financial interest known to him or a material financial interest is one that would reasonably be expected to impair the director's judgment when authorizing the transaction or the director knows a related party who is a party or had material financial interest, this related party being someone in a family tree who lives in the same household or an entity the director controls or which the director serves as a director. But on one hand, the MBCA giveth, on the other, it taketh away. And while it does giveth a bit more in terms of what counts as a DCIT, it also takes some of that liability away by having a pretty clear safe harbor standard. Unlike in Delaware General Corporation Law Section 144, where it took the court's little wrangling to get us into a safe harbor, the MBCA is more clear that if we follow these guidelines, we'll be in a safe harbor. The first way to get in the safe harbor is authorization of the transaction by a majority of qualified directors. We need at least two of them. Now, a qualified director is someone who does not have a conflicting interest in the transaction or has no material relationship with a conflicted director. This means that we wouldn't expect that person to get any actual or potential benefit and therefore would not expect that director to have impaired judgment when considering the DCIT. The second way is approval by a majority of disinterested shareholders. And notice here that it clarifies that we need approval by disinterested shareholders, not just all shareholders. That seems to be the case now under Delaware, but again, the MBCA is a little more clear that we need majority of disinterested qualify in the safe harbor. And they have to hold qualified shares, which means they are not held by the conflicted director or a related party after disclosure and notice of material facts. And then, of course, the third way is approval under a fairness standard, but we really don't want to go there. Fairness means the court has reviewed the transaction and looks for fairness both in substance and in process that is both a fair price and fair dealing. It's an expensive litigation with a lot of uncertainty, so ideally we're going to get into the safe harbor through approval from qualified directors or approval from holders of qualified shares, disinterested stockholders, disinterested shareholders who hold those qualified shares are our best two ways to get into that MBCA safe harbor. So let's recap and review what we learned today. First, we defined director conflict of interest transactions. And we saw that this generally means the director is on both sides. It's a little bit of a narrower definition, meaning there are fewer things that would qualify in Delaware, a little bit broader under the MBCA, but a very similar standard. We also saw there were similar ways of cleansing a director conflict of interest transaction. In Delaware, again, a little bit easier to do. So there's fewer things that count as DCITs and a little bit easier ways to cleanse them, although less clarity that those procedures will get us in a safe harbor. However, the courts have generally upheld that. Under the MBCA, we see more clarity that we'll get into a safe harbor, but a little stronger, uh, stricter requirements to meet that standard. We talked about Rumiliard Brick, where we saw how California got their statute wrong and an activist judge had to kind of go in there and fix it up. Delaware General Corporation Law Section 144 is our 
modern standard for most of our publicly traded corporations. Benihana of Tokyo, Inc. was a case that proceeded under that law. And then the Model Business Corporation Act, Subchapter F, that model rule being revised in 2005, adopted by some states, uh, and relevant for many corporations that are not publicly traded as well as some that are. So that's all for Director Conflicts 1 out of 3. We have two more lessons to cover. In our next lesson, we're going to look at how a director could be interested, even if they don't have a financial interest, explore a little more deeply that structural bias argument and talk about special litigation committees. Have a couple cases to cover there, Oracle and Martha Stewart Living Omni Media, and then Louis V. Vogelstein and Heizenga. So after we cover those cases, we're going to move into the Corporate Opportunity Doctrine, which is our last but not least of our triad of lessons on the duty of loyalty. Thanks for joining. See you next time.